I'm Brian V, and this is Why We Work. Today, I have the great pleasure of speaking with Natalie Bourne. Natalie is an innovation consultant, a strategy consultant, and she's the vice president of innovation for Territory Global. Not only that, she's a pretty good storyteller as she has her own podcast, The Innovation Meets Leadership. I want to find out some of the good and the bad ideas that she has come across, and maybe even some of her own when we look into the future of innovation. Join me in this conversation with Natalie Bourne. I'm Brian V, and this is why we work. As I just mentioned, I have the great pleasure of speaking with Natalie Bourne. Good morning, young lady. <laughs> Good morning. Will you do me a favor? I just did an introduction of you. Could you just tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll get into some of the questions I have you have a, for you about why you work? Sure. So I'm Natalie Bourne and um, I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, went to college out here um, at Oglethorpe and then began working at the age of 19 and have kind of worked ever since. Um, along that journey, got my MBA and then today I'm actually the Vice President of Innovation for Territory Global. So I essentially help organizations to um, think outside the box, remove some of the barriers that they might be feeling in order to innovate and, and to work forward. So that's what I'm doing today. Natalie, you mentioned you, you started working at 19, but I'd like to bring people further <laughs> back if at all possible. Was that your very sure. first job or was that your very first professional no. job? <laughs> that was my first professional job, but yeah. I, I first worked at probably age 15 in an okay. office, which is kind of weird to say as a kid working yeah, in an office. You're the I, first I one that said an office. I had lemonade stands. I had a guy uh, today, <laughs> he was uh, doing a puppet show <laughs> for 10 cents a show. Uh, you're the okay. first one to say an <laughs> office job. How did you get yeah. that job and, and what got you out of the house to get it? So, you know, it's interesting. My parents have always shown me a, a pretty strong work ethic growing up. So I've always seen my mom and dad working. My mom actually owned her own modeling agency. So I always would go to work with her. If I was ever sick, sometimes I would end up at her work uh, laying on a pallet by her, you know, in her office while she worked. So I was just accustomed to seeing um, my family contribute and and my brother worked at a very early age. Um, his first job was at Chick-fil-A. So, so there's the food service. Um, but, you know, so so when I saw that, I also wanted to contribute when I got to an age where I could. So for me, that was that was really um, I don't know why I wanted to work in an office. I think growing up, I always played in the office with mm -hmm. the stapler and the mm -hmm. markers and the paper and I just enjoyed organizing things. I enjoyed organizing people, um, initiatives. And so I was always organizing something. And so just going to an office to work felt natural. And so we had a, a family friend that um, asked me to, to come work at their office. And, and that's how I got started in the business world at 15. <laughs> so at that time, I mean, you seem, if you're in it, at 19 too as a professional 15 isn't much earlier than that did you have you said your parents helped you along the way but the mind frame of work is very important at 15 and i just to give you context at 15 i didn't and i know there's many people that yeah. did not as well is and you know what's you know what's my friends doing or where's the next party or something like that did you have that different mindset which said work is really important and I need to start saving and I'm going to think very strongly about my college and my, and my future career, even at that age. You know, I was a big saver, but I wasn't thinking about college. I was just saving and I didn't have like a vision for saving, um, which is unfortunate. So um, I did have some money saved up, but it was nowhere near enough money to send me to college. Mm -hmm. And so um, I had to work, during college and also go to college. So I worked near full-time and then also took a full-time load um, in college in order to, to get through that season. And, and looking back, if I had thought about the big picture, I would have saved along the way to, to save up for my own college, but I didn't really have that vision at the time. And so um, one of the things I think is so important for your listeners that have kids is to give their children a vision from a very early age of, um, 
you know, what, why are they doing what they're doing? And so in some places, my parents did a really good job in other places. They just didn't know. Mm -hmm. And, um, and now I'm having to reflect on where those areas were. And so for my children, I'm, I'm saying, you know, when they get money, let's talk about what you like to do with that money. Let's give that money a purpose. And so it wasn't until much later in life that I realized that you could give your money a purpose and that if you put enough of that, you know, money towards a purpose, you could actually um, win and be successful in a specific area, whether it's saving or giving or, mm -hmm. or paying your way through college. So unfortunately, no, I did not learn that as I was, as I was working. It's funny you mentioned parents and as you say it, I'm thinking so many blind spots we have, right? Like we're trying yeah. to do this and we're, but we're missing out on some other valid point that would help our kids along the way. I heard of a man who had, I believe, four or five daughters and they must have been in their 20s by then. And he said, you know what I learned so far that I know nothing. And it, like, he was probably yeah. a very good father, but you miss out and you miss those opportunities. So while, you know, mm -hmm. give cre giving credit to your parents for doing some really good things, something they missed out, but now you'll have an even more solid foundation for your own kids and for listeners and for myself yeah. to say, well, yeah, school is very valuable. Money is also very mm -hmm. valuable. And then the different ways that you can use your education. And as you just said, using money, like not only saving for yourself, but to give and to use it wisely. That's, that's yeah, you, that's wise. You said yeah. you got into, you did your MBA. So getting into college, mm -hmm. was it, you were business oriented all the way through or were you leaning at all? And cause you're an innovation and that doesn't usually, mm -hmm. I know it is now, but coincide with business, like, you know, maybe more arts yeah. or outside of the box sort of thing. Were you weaving between those two? You know, it's interesting. So when I was in, if we go back to high school, um, I actually wanted to study genetics. I actually loved um, just the understanding of DNA strands and you really you know, had receptive your and really tight. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why, but I was yeah, looking I for a pair of jeans and you're looking at <laughs> genetics. So <laughs> maybe I was just a nerd. Let's call it what it was. No, but, no. But I, listen, I, I appreciate <laughs> all types and let's say it how it is, you had your head on straight wanting to get it. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I mean, from an early age, I just, I just loved studying that stuff. And I remember um, that I got into advanced biology, but everybody in my class had already been in advanced chemi chemistry together and I had not been with them. So the teacher kept referring everything back to, well, remember in advanced chemistry where we did this? And I'm like, I'm lost. So it was at that point in time in that class that I realized, I don't think I'm gonna make it as a geneticist. I'm gonna to have to switch my major. <laughs> so, because I, I barely made it through that class, I think I got a C out of the kindness of the teacher's heart. Mm -hmm. And so I said, let me get out of this, this field. Obviously I'm kind of in over my head. And that was, you know, probably 16 or 17 when I said, let's go into business. And so um, one of the things that you're right, I mean, businesses, it can be very structured and sometimes boring. And as I took classes in college, I realized I don't want to study accounting. I don't want to study finance. That's not interesting to me. But there was this one class that was called Entrepreneurship and Innovation. And so I went and Same sat class. in that teacher's class. Yes. It was like yes. small business so, and innovation or entrepreneurship. Greatest class ever. Yeah. So that was an amazing class. And, and obviously, I had to get through the accounting classes and all the finance mm -hmm. classes. But And I did not enjoy those. But what I enjoyed was that entrepreneurship class where we had to put together a business plan and we had to figure out how to launch a business. What would that be like? What would we do? How do we create the idea? That was the class that just captivated my attention. What was your business? So <laughs> one of the girls in our, in our group. How many her, were in um, your group? Do you, uh, I remember those groups. Those like groups were great. How yes. many people were in there? Those groups were great or they were horrible. Um, we had three people. <laughs> For me, so it, it was, was great. It was three I ladies. all the, the, the smartest people in the class. <laughs> I feel like I'm the one that always got like stuck doing all the work at midnight. <laughs> you got guys and, like yeah. me. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, sorry, I didn't get it done. Sorry about that. So. Yeah, but, but we what had was... like three people in our group and 
one of the girls, I think it was her boyfriend or something, he was a musician or something. So she wanted to start a record label. So, uh, which was not really what I wanted to do, but she was very passionate about it. So we, we went along and started this record label together and we had to create business plans for it and all this other stuff. And so that was really, at the end of the day, the, the business plan, not what I would have done. I would have done something very techy, but that was where we landed. <laughs> We had one business plan, Saz, Joseph, and I, because there was two in this particular group. Uh, it was a, in Nova Scotia, Canada, recycling. This is 20 years ago. So recycling was very, very big and composting is very big. So we invented mm -hmm. the idea of having a truck come by and clean your compost bin. It, it wasn't oh, very yeah. innovative, but it was important in Nova Scotia yeah. at the time. And now it's, but it was great. It was great working with him and we did very well in that class. So with the, the, did you have any other, cause I was going to get into some of the ideas that you're dealing with now in innovation. Did you have any other ideas? Mm -hmm. Like you mentioned um, working with your mom or being around your mom and modeling and your brother mm -hmm. in Chick-fil-A. Did you have any other ideas mm -hmm. that could be something like innovative? Hmm. You mean just growing up? Just growing up. Yeah. Um, so, you know, honestly, this is, this is kind of a funny conversation I had with my mother and it's, as you were talking about, um, art as well, I actually had a bent towards art. So when I was younger, I liked to design, I liked to design clothing mm -hmm. and, um, I would actually teach myself how to sew and design clothing. And, you know, I think <laughs> my mom and I had this conversation where she's like, Hey, artists are like starving. So you may want to pick <laughs> another field to go in because I don't want you to yeah. starve. Yeah. And so um, that was kind of part of the way that I landed in business as well. Um, but I always had this like design portion that I really liked, which was let me look at something and figure out how to design it or, or how to make it uh, more interesting or more intricate or more artistic. Let me, how do I make it beautiful and give it clean lines? So I've always kind of had that piece in me too, um, which I know is kind of, um, at times I've always felt like I've been fighting with my left brain and right brain of like, who's going to win. Right. And, and so, um, but, but that, that piece of art, which you mentioned earlier is, is, has always been a part of me too. And so for me, ideas in the early age, um, were always kind of design based. You may want to highlight some of the careers because I know you've kind of jumped in a couple of different paths, like in the automotive industry as well. Mm -hmm. um, what has led you to your job today and how have you settled where you are? Yeah, so gro growing up, um, I started at a startup when I was 19 called headhunter.net. And then Headhunter got bought by CareerBuilder and we became CareerBuilder.com. And so um, throughout my career, I was there 11 and a half years. Um, a lot of what I did was um, I would get dropped into a team. I would learn everything I, I needed to learn there. And then I would figure out how to make that team better. And then I'll be honest, I would get a little bored and say, what's next? And then I would go over to another team and figure out how I could, you know, serve that team and, and, and do better than what was kind of being done. And then I would get bored and say, what's next. So throughout career builder, I moved around a lot. Um, I, I probably had eight or nine positions in 11 years. Um, so just, and it was a high growth organization. So you were expected to, um, you know, not just sit, but you were expected to, to move. And so, um, what it taught me was that, I needed to be able to drop myself into any team, any problem, learn very quickly uh, what the issues were, what the roadblocks were, and then be able to overcome those roadblocks. And um, really, when I think about my mantra, I like to create, um, I like to make sense out of chaos. I just do. It's, it's, you know, you walk into a team and you can see puzzle pieces just scattered all along. I like to gather them up and be like, okay, so this is the picture we're trying to build. And each of you only have a little small part of it. Natalie, like I know my dear wife. I don't know. That I think there's something on Netflix called like Tidy House. Not like Tiny House, but Tidy House. It's like, it's a, like a Japanese lady mm -hmm. who goes in people's dirty houses on or unorganized houses and tidy this. I mean, she lives... Like if you can fold an, an undershirt, she'll fold it like five times opposed to me. If I fold it, but fold it once, just chuck it in there. And my dear wife yeah. can organize 
anything so well. And so you're talking about making the most out of chaos. Is there, was that also a path in your life as well of doing this? Is this a, a motherly instinct? Is, where is this coming from? Because that, yeah, you are probably, <laughs> you are such a valuable asset to a team. Because, you know, even from your college days, you know, being in that team and organizing and, and making the best of what you have is, is, is one of the best things you can possibly have. So was that something, Pat, and mind you, my dear wife organizes too much at times. So <laughs> you probably have people say, okay, Natalie, okay, we got it. We, it can be better. We got it. But is, is that something that you've found along the way as well? And this is where you no. survive? Yeah, you know, I, th I think my husband would wish that it transferred into the house because it does. <laughs> I, I am not an organized person in my like personal life, um, but, but I think you know I organize concepts and ideas, and mm -hmm. so that's where I think um, where I shine. Unfortunately, I don't shine in in doing it to a house, <laughs> but I do shine in doing it. The concept it in, is in, there, though. I mean, yeah, like, for you yeah. to be able to do that, that even shows you know, a different mindset, a, a different ability to organize these rather large issues you're having with companies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So in, and how did that bring you to where you are today? So I think, you know, one of the reasons, and you know, I'm willing to try anything. I've, I've tried some different things in my role. So I've led, led product, I've led sales. Um, but ultimately, you know, for me and, and why I love the career that I'm in right now, which is consulting and innovation is because, um, because I mentioned, I like to come in and bring order, but once the order is established, somebody has to operationalize mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And I'm not your operationalizing type of person. I can get it to a certain point. And then when I see it's running like a well-oiled machine, I'm look at, I'll look at you and I'll say, great. Now what's next? Mm -hmm. And so, um, the beauty of, of the role that I'm in today is I can, step into organizations, look at, you know, where there might be an area of challenge or chaos or things aren't just running the way that they should and say, okay, let's, let's put all the pieces on the table. Let's figure out what the picture is. Now, is that the picture we want or do we want to make a different picture? And then once we've done that, how do we launch you guys into a place where you can be successful and operationalize this? And then I get to go to the next client and start that question all over again. So the idea of bringing innovation and consulting together, um, I wouldn't have been able to do that right out of college. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, just the experience that I've gained from running product development, from running sales has helped me be able to step into organizations and say, hey, I've been in your shoes. I've, I've dealt with this problem before. There's 30 ways we can solve it, but let's figure out what makes the most sense for your organization. So as an innovation consultant, did you see someone else in this role that it's something you aspired to do or was it something you just fell into? How did that come about? Yeah, so um, I have not, I don't think I've ever worked with an innovation consultant in my career. Um, this was an area of just personal passion for me. And reason being, I'd find that there's two areas um, in all the organizations I've worked in and just all the, the different people I've worked with, I find there's two areas where if people don't have this, it's almost impossible to be successful. The first area is, is leadership and being really good at understanding people, having empathy, leading people well. And then the other area is innovation. If you lack innovation, um, the ability to generate ideas and push ideas forward, then I find that that's also an area of harm overall to your career. Um, because even in an operational role, you have to be able to think outside the box. What do you like? So when you speak, can you define innovation for you? Because I'm thinking more of technology and all, but you're speaking the whole gamut of way a businesses operate. So can you define your role exactly how that, like, especially for someone wanting to, they find themselves in your shoes, similar shoes in that they like to make the best out of chaos. They have a lot of experience, but they don't like to stay stagnant in a particular job. And they like this constant, challenge of helping but also moving on could you define mm -hmm. it absolutely so i mean to me at, at the, just the basic level innovation is the ability to create new ideas mm -hmm. 
and to move those new ideas forward. And so if we think about innovation like that, that can really apply anywhere at any time. Um, and, and so there, there are a couple of different types of innovation. Um, you know, there's transformative, there's disruptive. Disruptive is like when you're disrupting an entire industry. If you think mm -hmm. about, um, I'll give you an old school example, like when Apple first came out with the iPod, um, it wasn't just a technology thing. They were, they were disrupting the, the music industry mm -hmm. as a whole, mm -hmm. and they were disrupting the way it was distributed. Um, we all know of the blockbuster Netflix example as a disruptive thing in an industry. Um, and so there is that type of, of, of innovation, and that's important. But there can be transformative innovation. So when you move from iPhone 7 to 8, you made the camera better. Well, that's important. That's, that's taking something and improving on it, incrementally uh, making it, it better. And that is also a form of innovation. So we kind of have, you know, a couple different buckets that we would put innovation mm -hmm. in. But what's important is that you are creating something that doesn't exist today and you're creating something that's, you know, new. It doesn't have to be greenfield and no one's ever heard of it before, but it does need to be, be new. And it does need to uh, be something that you're not working on today. So how difficult it, is it being in your position, whether it's the VP position or just being an innovation consultant in that you're, you're looking for new things or, you know, maybe to reshuffle a company to help them out mm -hmm. a little bit better, but it, it's something that's not quite there. And then you have to maybe encourage or push people to think outside of that box. Where do you find difficulty? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely hard when you're saying, hey, you've always thought this way, and now we're asking you to think differently. What I find is that um, people, you know, I love the quote that someone said, like, people don't, it's not that people don't like change, they just don't like the way you're trying to change them. So part of the journey, the change journey that you have to take people on is from, you have to help them, number one, understand that there's a need for change. One of the most important things that I've found in organizations is if they don't disrupt themselves, they will be disrupted. Whether it's by the economy, which we've experienced in 2020, whether it's through you know pandemics, whether it's through uh, a security breach, anything like that, those things create disruption in an organization. And so what you're trying to do is create a need in them and it has to be genuine and real. It can't be just contrived. It has to be something that helps them to understand the need for change. Once they understand the need for change and they can see that there's a bridge to get to change, people are more willing to go with you on that bridge. And so what's important with, with that is that you handhold them as we go. You don't push them over the edge, right? So you have to show them there is a bridge to get you there. It's not gonna kill you. You're not gonna die. And as we go over this bridge, um, you're going to help me build it. So one of the most important things about change is that people have to see it as something that they, it has to be their idea. And the beauty about what I get to do is oftentimes the answers are already in the room. They just don't know it. And the hardest thing for people to do is collaborate. So when we're not collaborating, we don't know that, you know, Brian, you've got a part of the idea and I have the other part. And if we would just talk to each other, we could actually build this thing. And so mm -hmm. part of my job is to get all those people out of their offices and into a, a, a room together and, and have their ideas start to come out. And then we start to take those ideas and shape them in a way where now nobody, no one person can say that was my idea because we all own the idea and it's moving and it's growing and it's maturing. And when we leave that room on day two or three, we're in a completely different place than we were in day one when we were all holding our ideas and saying, you can't have this, this is mine. Now we're saying, I love that, who did that? And we're like, we did that. And so it's really helping people go on this change journey in a way where they feel um, like they have a shared sense of ownership. And so we're not pushing them we're leading them. And I, and I just, I love that part of my job. It's what makes it fun. Well, that leads into my next question of satisfaction. Where do you find satisfaction? I can only imagine being in this group and you have Bob and Jane and they're sharing ideas and then they're looking at each other like, we have it. Like we had, we had it the whole time. What do we need yeah. Natalie for? But, but obviously <laughs> exactly. we need Natalie. Yeah. But it's like, hey, we, we could have, you know, we can do this together. So what yeah. is the satisfaction or the most satisfaction you get out of your position now? 
Yeah, I think for me, it is in these sessions where we step back. So, so we kind of, um, you know, there's two ways we work these days, right? A lot of us are not going into people's office anymore. We're actually, so I work on a mural, which is taking sticky notes and putting them on a, you know, on a, on a board that's uh, digital versus having to do it um, live in a room. But it's that point either in the room or in the mural where you zoom out, you have everyone step back and stand at the back of the room and look at all the work they did. And you're like, look at all that you've accomplished. Look at all you've done. And we started over here at the beginning of the day and we were a little rough and a little grouchy and we didn't know where we were going to go or how we were going to get there. And at the end of the day or at the end of the couple of days, look at what we've created. We've created not just one solution. We've created five solutions that are really viable. We're going to go test a couple of those. And then if those, you know, if you don't like those, we've got a couple more we can test, but we went from just disparate ideas, people that, you know, wanted to own their silo to people that were willing to pull the silo down and say, look what we did as a team together. And that's how we should be working. And so that's what I love is, is being able to change the way people think and work. What would you say, I mean, this takes, I think, a little bit of humility to say, what kind of character does it take to do your position? So, I mean, you might have the perfect character, but you're also learning that, you know, maybe a little push here is maybe good for this person and maybe a little bit more sympathy and understanding Mm -hmm. for people to start speaking and to share their ideas. So how are you finding that um, balance and character with yourself or where other innovation consultants kind of failed Mm -hmm. for for these companies. Yeah. I mean, so let's start here because you just brought up something really important and very beautiful. So when I first started working in my career early on, it was about me. It was about... You were were 19. (laughs) (laughs) Well, even when I was 25, it was still all about me. And I'll be honest. you were only 25. (laughs) You don't want to know what I was doing at 19 and 25. Like you're talking about being a career woman, like all the power to you. So all the grace goes to you, but continue. Yeah, no. So, I mean, you know, it's interesting. There's, I think in order to do what I do, which is facilitation, you have to, it cannot be about you. You kind of have to drain yourself of the ego and we all have it and we have it to varying degrees. And when you own a silo or a part of an organization, typically Um, you become the person in charge of that silo and everybody else becomes the enemy because now you're fighting for resources. You're fighting for time, Mm -hmm. face time, time for my initiative to to be um, presented versus someone else's. And then it always becomes this zero sum game, right? Where no one can really win. And that's unfortunate. And that's the way most people work. And I think that part of what I love that I get to do is I couldn't necessarily solve for why that was when I was deep in the trenches of it. But now that I've stepped outside and looked at, you know, looked at the scenario and the situation, I've realized that a lot of times in organizations, we need to spend more time teaming than we do telling people what to get done and what their initiatives are. Because the team that can, the can fight back to back is the team that's always going to win. And the team that in fights will never actually be able to look up and understand what's going on in the market because they're so busy fighting one another. And unfortunately, that's very normal for corporate culture. So, So being able to step back as a facilitator and say, it's not about me, it's not about my ideas because this is their company. My job is to draw the best ideas out, to help them draw all the ideas out, get them on the board, help them arrive and and prioritize the best ideas and to really help move them through this day in a way where they can be successful. That's that's the beauty is, is you're not looking at your own success now. Your success is tied to someone else's. And when each of our success is tied to the other person, we now are in a place of giving, not in a place of taking. When it's only about my success, I wanna take. When it's about our collective success, I now want to give. And so moving people into a place where they see each other as humans, as people, as, you know, uh, as individuals that matter and helping them move towards collective success is, you know, really the job that I do. And the beauty is I don't need an ego to do that. Is this easy to wed together, the knowing and the doing? So as you're sitting there and, you know, there's a boardroom in front of you, and you have an idea, you, you might want, 
and maybe you have to bite your tongue, you might know something that could help them. But mm-hmm. just to step back is, is it hard to ease that temptation? Or is it you're a professional now, you've been doing it long enough, you know exactly what to do? It's hard to, and but I, I understand that I have to, because mm-hmm. if I have the idea in the first 30 seconds of the meeting, <clears throat> then nobody feels that they own it. Mm-hmm. And nobody is going to, it's not going to feel like a shared sense. Now, there's been several times, right, where I may be like, oh, it'd be so good if they just did this. And that might be slip close to where they note. land, right? <laughs> just slip that on there. <laughs> but it doesn't matter what I think. Because if I can't get them to build the future together in that session, they'll, they'll never, never be do on board. Yeah. Yeah. It'll never happen. So that's so important to, to bite my tongue. I might be like, okay, just jot it down for yourself so you can say you knew, but mm-hmm. then close the binder and yeah. put it aside because it's not about you. And so I think that even if we can approach this as people who work in corporations and go into teams and say, you know, Hey, let's, let's put ourselves aside and figure out what's in the best interest of the organization. And so it's so hard, I think, for us as humans to take off the silo hat. You know, I run marketing or I run sales and to put on the, hey, I'm on the executive team. Team. What do we as the executive team need to do to make sure this company is successful, not only this year, but but in the years to come? You are humble. And as a humble person, this might be a difficult question to answer, but what is something that you would like people to understand about your job and what it is you do so they can have a better appreciation for the work that you're doing? Yeah. I mean, I think it's, um, that's a great question. Gosh. Um, I, I think it's what I'd like people to understand about my job is that, um, you know, at the end of the day, I'm here to help people surface the very best ideas and to help their organization win. And, you know, you can call that a number of different things, right? You could just call me a facilitator or just a consultant, but bringing in the innovation edge, I think is very important because what we can then do is step back and look at, okay, great. This is a solution for your organization. Let's step back and look at the expanse of the industry and understand um, if you're taking a bet on something that's not going to be the future. Perfect example really quick, Nokia and Apple, right? Nokia, let's go back to 2004 to 2007. They invested, Nokia invested $22 billion in R&D. Apple invested $2.5 billion in R&D. You can see the disparity there and you know how much each person invested, but it was Apple that moved ahead. Mm-hmm. Why? Because Apple bet on the smartphone. They bet on that technology that was the future, whereas Nokia was betting on the technology they had today. So it is amazing as a team to get a good idea but then you have to step back and look at the expanse of the industry and say where is the industry going and is this idea going to leave us behind and are we going to be left in the dust by our competitors so the innovation edge not only grabs that idea and says what's the idea but it says now let's throw it up in light of the industry what is the industry doing and then we can look at that and say it's a great idea, but we're going to be five years behind if we invest in this idea because we already have people that are leaning into technology that we don't have. So it would be better for us to figure out how to lean into that technology and come back in six months and create an idea that will we'll sit on that technology versus going with our um, outdated technology that won't get us where we need to go. You talk about being left behind and, and in the dust. How do you not get left behind i mean you're you're in an innovation Mm -hmm. but you also have to sharpen your skills as well so how do you stay productive and keep going yes so i'm i'm a big reader i'm always reading um i've probably listening to four books right now on audible all at the same time and then typically what i'll do is if i'm really drawn to the book i will buy it that way i can see the visual pictures whatever's in there to help you kind of connect all the dots so reading for me is like Fun, it's really fundamental in, in making sure that um, that I'm moving with the industry. But then I'm, you know, I'm always reading like Harvard Business Review, and then um, I'm always watching videos. So I keep up a lot with like you know SpaceX and Elon Musk and some of the the things that they're doing because 
the models that they've built for innovation, the speed at which they innovate is a very important thing that I think a lot of organizations can learn from. And so one of the cool things that I took away from like something recent that I, that I was listening to from Elon Musk is he was talking about how there is punishment uh, if people don't innovate. So you're fired if you don't innovate, if you're in a role that you can and you don't do it. But then there's small punishments if you fail, which I find really interesting. Um, because I've always, you know, I've never, I've thought, well, let's celebrate failure, but they say we're going to celebrate it with a small punishment. Um, but the idea that, you know, your, your innovations need to be thoughtful. Mm -hmm. You can't just waste the organization's money. It needs to be thoughtful and you need to be able to think through what you're doing. And so that's really important. And then, um, you know, and so as I, as I look at what I read and, and, and what I'm staying, uh, up with it's really important to to do that and then i also help a couple of startups just to understand you know what are you incubating what are you working on and, and how are they going to move that forward so part of it is reading part of it's just staying really close to the innovation industry you know um innovations in the industry and, and what's going on with them and um yeah it's a lot of reading but but that's kind of how i stay stay up with what's going on are you encouraged by what's happening or what seems or what's coming up in the future are you encouraged to see some of the, the new innovations and how people are thinking about the future? I am more so than I've ever been. I think, you know, I think we were stagnant for a little while. I mean, we've had a lot of innovation in software, but it's great to see innovation in automotive through, through what Elon Musk is doing. It's great to see it in, in space exploration. Mm -hmm. um, one of the cool things, you know, that, that he's built is this rocket booster that we don't have to throw away billions of dollars every time we, we launch someone to space. I saw a video um, today about something that has landed in yes. Texas recently. Yep. It's its seventh land. So you don't, it's not just right. flashing up into the ocean. Exactly. So just little, little incremental innovations like that have been really powerful. And, you know, when you talk to Elon Musk, you kind of, not that I've spoken to him before, mm -hmm. but you know, when you listen to him interviewed, yeah. um, you, you think, man, this guy's kind of, out there right like but he's actually doing stuff and so one of the things he said recently is like we should be taking starfleet missions like we should be taking missions in space and the idea that like oh um i don't know that anyone else is thinking like that but then he's actually backing it up with action and he's doing stuff and so it's you have to combine those things if you're going to be an innovation you can't just be talk you have to be delivering and that is encouraging i mean you think about there's some people who think I mean, I don't know if you remember the commercial time to make the donuts. I don't know if it was Robin yes. donuts or something. I mean, yeah. so the idea, and it's not that he was an actor, but this is, I got to do this. I'm going to work. I'll come, go to work. I'll come home. And this is my day, but you have Elon Musk. Okay. We need space invaders or, you know, let's make uh, tunnels in mm -hmm. LA right? So people can travel underneath ground. Like you're just thinking outside of the box and that whether that particular thing works, it's at least stretching the boundaries. Yeah. And I feel like it's been a while since we as a, you know, a people have stretched the boundaries in a way that is really meaningful. Um, and so we've done it in incremental pockets, you know, we've done it in certain industries, but seeing something that could be um, used, you know, worldwide, that's, that's really to me, um, the purpose of innovation and the excitement about innovation. On a side note, I wonder, <clears throat> excuse me, I wish we had one little island that we can just dedicate to garbage and everyone in the world agrees to this is the place and we'll make it the best garbage place of all places and we'll process it and we'll spit out other things, reusable things, but this will be the place and then we won't have to be dumping it in certain people's countries and then laying blame and polluting different places. Just some, or I, some idea. Speaking of technology, what is something that you use that you couldn't do without? And it may not be technology. It could be your mind, right? It could be something that you use. It's just very integral to your job and it keeps you very efficient. Yeah. So, okay. After I am going to say a software. So, um, <clears throat> so I use mural a lot. Have you ever mm -hmm. used mural? No, I've uh, heard of it. Like Tello, would that be a similar? Trello, Trello, yeah. Trello. Yeah. So, um, the reason I, I love mural so much is because it's, it's become a way where I can help people work better, collaborate better. Um, 
I've taken it into a couple meetings where I'm like, okay, guys, we're going to all get in mural and we're going to work. And afterwards I get all these messages of like, what, what was that we were in? Cause this was the best meeting I've ever had. And that, and that wasn't me leading the meeting. That wasn't what made it so good. It was the fact that everyone saw their ideas getting recorded. Cause a lot of times we go into meetings and we just do this. We talk, 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 and then we leave and no one has a clue what happened. Was there any productivity and did anything get done? But when you start to get all their ideas up on the board, what happens is they say, I feel heard. I see my idea right there on that blue sticky. Now maybe it will evolve and it will become a different idea later on down the road, but I can see that you, you saw me, you heard me. And those are two of the most important things. So Mural allows me to do that. And, and especially when we all went into lockdown with COVID, I was walking around in people's offices with sticky notes and helping them you know, innovate and think outside the box that way. And for, to have Mural in my pocket and to say, we are not going to miss a beat. We are still going to collaborate. We're still going to innovate. You, we're just going to do it asynchronously, right? You can, you can take this board. You can work mm -hmm. on it at any time. You can evolve this idea. I don't have to be in your office to do it. Um, if you wake up at 2 a.m. and have an amazing thought, you can put it in here. <laughs> and I don't have to be awake to help you with it. So just the idea that we could still continue to move people forward and we could continue to move ideas forward despite the lockdown. Can that be and found on mural.com is it yeah i think it's i want to say it's mural.co okay, cool yeah mural.co m-u-a-r-l.co mm -hmm. um but yeah i mean that that's been huge just to be able to to help people move forward and not miss a beat it's it's been um like it's been my livelihood sustained having mural so so that's been something i haven't been able to live without this this year what would you say, Natalie, as a top tip for people getting into work or changing their career as you have done different things for ever finding your, your passion, um, people disgruntled with their work, or just someone coming out of high school looking for work? What would be a tip that you have for them? Yeah. I mean, I can remember back in, in my career when, when I was in a role that was not working for me. And the first thing I did is reach out to an executive coach and we sat down and the first thing she helped me understand was how to talk about my talent. So I think as a, um, as anybody, whether you're, you know, coming out of high school, coming out of college, or you've been in a career for 10 years, but you're not happy. The first thing you have to do is learn how to properly articulate what your talent is. And so I couldn't keep you know, I couldn't just bounce from job to job trying to figure it out at that point. I was way too far in my career. I had to be really deliberate about articulating that. Mm -hmm. So I had to say, what is my talent? What am I good at? Once she helped me articulate it in a way where I could tell other people, then it made it very clear. And we had this really interesting conversation where she was like, Natalie, you need to go work for a startup or you need to go be a consultant or you need to go <laughs> do something on your own, start your own company. She's like, because you have an entrepreneurial spirit mm -hmm. that you can't survive in a corporation for a long period of time with that entrepreneurial spirit, because if they won't let you move or go work on different things, like it's, it's going to frustrate you. So I had to acknowledge that, recognize that in myself and then figure out, well, what best career path would suit somebody like me? And so oftentimes, you know, when we're younger, I would say, don't be afraid to try things, but make sure that you're always um, leaning back into that thing you tried to say, what did I love about it? And what did I hate about it? So that you can better articulate your talent. And at the end of the day, if we can't articulate our talent to ourselves, we're going to end up in jobs we hate because we don't understand what makes us tick. And one of the beautiful things my coach helped me understand is you are not an operational person, but you're in an operational job. You need to move out of that operational job and get into a job that can help you really um, leverage the skills that you have. And you have an entrepreneurial spirit, not an operational spirit. So that's really important. If you're in a job where you have to generate ideas, but you just want to operate things and run them, you're going to be miserable. So, so finding what, what matters to you and what makes you tick is, is incredibly important as a, you know, as a leader, as someone um, working, because you want to have joy at work and you want to enjoy what you're doing. And if you're in a job, that's just not a good fit for you personally, you're not going to enjoy it. I wish I had your coach. <laughs> she's amazing amy baylog shout out to amy <laughs> I, I think a lot of people wish they had amy 
<laughs> oh, that would have been great advice. And, and right. it still is. It's still applicable today. And it's for anyone yeah. who listens, it's finding what it is that you're good at and, and keep leaning towards that, even if you're doing something else. So you are busy. So how do you find a balance in separating work from the rest of your life? And what, what do you do to, to balance that out? How do you find that yeah. work-life balance? Yeah, you know, um, so several years ago, a long time ago, maybe even like, I want to say maybe back in like 2004 or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, I heard Jack Welsh speak. And it was just incredible to hear him. He's, you know, he's passed away now, but he was the president of GE for many, many years. And he said this thing that stuck with me forever. He said, it's not about work-life balance. Mm -hmm. It's about work-life choices. And the idea that at any given time, the choice lies with me. It's my choice, how I work, when I work. And what I do, um, it's one of the reasons why I changed, you know, my career to go into consulting is because I was one of those people that got up first thing I checked my phone, um, you know, ran out the door. I'm on a conference call on the way to work. I'm, you know, working a full full day, coming home, having dinner with the family, putting them to bed, and then I'm on my laptop again for three hours. And what I realized was that mode of operating was not sustainable. It's not sustainable long term. Mm -hmm. And you will burn out and um, you will be replaced and, um, and you will be the one to, to suffer for, for that burnout. So what I realized is, you know, a couple of years ago, I kind of hit this wall where I realized I need to change the way that I approach work and the way I think about work. And so that's going to require me to... Um, to really think differently in order to be productive. And it's going to require me to think outside the box about what are the only the things that I can do. And those are the things I need to do. And if there are things that someone else can do, I need to let them do that so that I can be successful, not only at work, but at home. And so oftentimes we only think of ourselves as being successful at work. We don't think about the impact in our home mm -hmm. if we're not successful, but that can tear your home upside down, right? So if you're not successful in your home, it doesn't matter if you're successful at work. Those two things have to work deeply and, and to, they have to work together. And so if they don't, um, your success at work doesn't matter. And that's oftentimes what I would tell my team. If you're not successful at home, I don't care what you're, how you're winning at work. Both of them need to be operating well. And so for me, it had to take a step back. So now my husband can call me on it and say, hey, get your laptop out of the bed. <laughs> it's time, you know, we're going to bed. Yeah. So just that idea of having someone that you can be accountable to to say, hey, like you've been doing great for six months, but I see like the work stuff starting to tick up again. We need to change that. Having someone that can call you, whether it's a family or friend, you know, mm -hmm in your life that can just say, Hey, this isn't healthy. Again, let's, let's go back and, and reiterate. Why do we work and work while it is fulfilling? It's also, you know, we, we don't live to work. We work to live. And so remembering that is, is really important. Well, I had the question, why do you rest? And then someone said, no, it's not about rest. I do. And then they said, you know, where's that work life balance? But I think I like, work-life choices i think that that is it is a choice right you yeah. have that choice to take out the laptop or pick up the phone and mm -hmm. and how you're going to uh be productive or you know how you're going to manage your day whether it's with family or with your work mm -hmm. what is something natalie that you wish you would have known i mean you really did have your head screwed on very well properly yeah. right from the get-go but is there something that you wish you would have known back in the yeah. day that you could tell someone about now that maybe that can help them? Yeah. So I remember this journal to your point. I really was, I think I grew up way too early in terms of being at work. No, you um, did I remember well. this journal I had <laughs> You did, <laughs> and well. I, would, I would record, you know, how much I was making and how much I wanted to be making by the end of the year. Nice. I would record the title I had and the title I wanted by the end of the year. And this went on for years where I would say, okay, I, I missed it by two grand or whatever. You know, I mm -hmm. didn't get to my goal. But one thing I forgot to do was enjoy the journey. I forgot to You're really just slow down. Yeah. yeah, I forgot to enjoy the journey. I forgot to, um, especially early in my career, really see people. You know, something that's so important, I think, about us as as career people and as leaders is people need to truly feel seen. They need to know that you care about them, that they matter. 
and I think that I was too busy seeing my next move to see people for a very long time. And so for me, if I could have changed, if I could have gone back in time and, and spoken to myself, it would have been to truly slow down and enjoy the journey. Because whether you get that job in a year or two years, that honestly doesn't make any difference. It's what are you, you learning? What's, what, what are you growing along the way in yourself and in others? And so um, very much, I think, you know, my earlier career was about me. And the part I love about what I do now is it's very difficult to make it about me because it's, it's, it's about someone else's success. Every project I drop in, no one's ever going to know that I was there once I leave. It, it's the team that gets held up as, as the people that win, not, oh, it was, you know, Natalie that, that facilitated that. Typically that doesn't happen. It's, it's them that gets to celebrate that win as a team. And so I had to, because I was, I think, so uh, about myself and about my own success in my early career, I've had to kind of flip that and say, I need to be about other people's success because I, I have enough experience to do it, but also because it's just right. And if I had learned that earlier, I think I could have been a better manager, better leader, a better boss. It's the essence of what you're saying about companies that work well too, rather than having the boss dictate what needs to be done, encouraging the teams to, to grow within themselves, to come up with the ideas and, and to be a force within themselves. Yes. And that's, you know, your own um, realization there. Is there a particular mistake that you made that you've learned a lot from or just a culmination of mistakes that you were able to take life lessons from? How long do you have? No, I'm just you, kidding. You have some time. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think for me, the, the biggest mistake that, that I've made is, is truly just, it's, it's selfishness, just seeing myself um, as more important. Do you know than what though, Natalie, and people have been saying that, I mean, you've been saying this and people have been hearing it, but you're humble because a lot of people won't admit I mean, in just the people say, oh yeah, I made a lot of state mistakes, but you're going back to being a 19 year old professional. You were 15 working in an office. You really did have your ducks lined up rather early, but even going back then and saying, do you know what? I, I wasn't as professional. I wasn't doing what I was, it's very commendable. So by you saying, you know, I, I just didn't have it quite right. You had a lot right. You had a, a lot right. So for you to be able to say, you know, there was even more that I could have improved on is, is truly um, humble of you. Mm. Well, thank you for saying that. And, you know, it's funny. I've I heard this definition of humility and I loved it so much that I use it all the time. Humility is agreement with the truth. Mm -hmm. And it's agreement with, if I'm good at something, just saying, hey, I'm really good at this. This is what I'm good at. But it's also... When you know when you mess up, just saying, yeah, I mess, I mess that up. It's it's agreement with the truth, and when we can do that, that's like where humility is allowed to come in. So I would say earlier in my career, I was afraid to admit when I did something wrong. I was just afraid of it. I didn't want to be called out in a meeting. I didn't want to be publicly humiliated. So I would actually hide my my failures, mm -hmm. and. I would, I would not let anyone know about them or maybe they would find out, but then it was like, who can we collectively blame this on? So it doesn't have to, all the heat doesn't have to fall on me. Um, and so I think one of the ways that you can see yourself making that shift in your career and in your life is when you're willing to raise your hand and say, before anyone else calls you out to say, Hey, I messed, I messed that up. <laughs> like, I want to tell you, I messed it up before you tell me. Um, and then let's talk about what we need to do to fix it. I think that, you know, earlier in my career where I felt that I did not uh, do well was accepting my failures. And I think as a, you know, as you, as you grow and as you get um, through things, you realize sometimes those failures are actually the birthplace of, of innovation. Um, a failure is you learning something that maybe a win would not have ever taught you. And so seeing the failures for what they are and seeing how powerful failures can be if used properly in your life, to me, that becomes uh, um, what's more, more important. And so I wish that someone could have told me that earlier in my career that like, hey, not every failure is, is a death sentence. Failure can be a lesson learned and it can actually catapult you towards something better because oftentimes what happens when we fail is we stop and we close up in that area and we don't keep pushing into that area because we just stamp it a failure and move on 
Well, that's what you said about, I think it was Elon Musk, about there's small punishments, but mm-hmm. there's new opportunities too. There's new opportunity yeah. for growth and learning. How You've touched on this with your own education, but for listeners, where do you place education regardless of the job? It could be a trade. It could be on-the-job training. It could be formal education. How high or how much do you value education for the individual? I think the younger you are, the, the more critical it is because you, I think what's really important is you have to expose yourself to a lot of different ideas and a lot of different ways of thinking. And I think when you're younger, that's, that's super critical just to have yourself exposed to a number of ways of thinking and working. Um, as you get older, you still need to do that, but it doesn't necessarily need to look like education. It can look like reading. It can look like, you know, all these different things. But, but I do think for me, it was very important to expose myself to education very early. And so, you know, I graduated um, college and, uh, you know, maybe about five years into my career, I said, I feel like I'm hitting a ceiling where I don't have the acumen that certain people have because early in my career, I was dealing with RC level executives and I could tell I had no clue half the time what they were talking about. (laughs) And I didn't have the acumen that they had, you know, a lot of these C levels that I was dealing with had law degrees and all these Mm -hmm. other things. So I realized that I had kind of reached my lid with my college education. So I decided to go to um, get my graduate degree or get my MBA because I needed to be able to speak to them on their level and not feel like um, they knew it all and I knew nothing. I wanted to feel like I at least had enough acumen to be in the room. And so I think in our, in our career, we, we will see points where we feel like we're hitting a wall or we're hitting a ceiling. And the importance is not to just feel like, you know, we throw our hands up in the air, but to say, well, what do I need to get to the next level? And because these people were highly educated and highly, um, you know, just very, very uh, brilliant in what they did, I knew that, you know, intelligence can be grown. It doesn't have to just be, it's, it's either in you or it's not. That's not how it works. I knew that I could grow my acumen mm-hmm. in a number of these areas in order to feel like I could have a intelligent conversation with them. <laughs> and I'm sure you held your own as well. And I'm sure no one felt or was as critical on you as you were of yourself. And it was Probably just true. something that you were ahead of in the game and just knowing in the future that this might be good for me rather than being where you were and feeling that you're, you were, you know, a small fish in a big pond. I think you were probably doing very well as your yeah. career shows that you kept um, growing and being promoted in, in what you did. Is there anything else, Natalie, um, that you would like to say in terms of encouragement for people feeling, you know, maybe disgruntled in their job, not liking, not sure. You kind of touched on this with, with mm-hmm. talents. Um, but just a word of encouragement for people in their work or getting into work. Yeah. I mean, I just, you know, one of the things I think about it, you know, I've been in a couple of different roles where I just knew that I was, you know, it was not the right role for me and I was super disgruntled about it. Um, But I also realized that that wasn't actually helping me um, to have that mindset. So I had to kind of think of it in in this way. Um, First, why is it that I don't like this role? And articulating that is very important so that you don't end up in the same role over again, because sometimes we can keep choosing the same roles and then we can't figure out why we're so miserable. Um, So why do I not like this role? And then what have I liked in the past that was enjoyable to me? So asking myself, you know, what have I done in the past that I just loved where I felt like I was, you know, being pushed out of my comfort zone in a good way and I was enjoying it. Articulating what I didn't like what I did like, and then asking myself, where are the similarities in the role and where are the differences so that I'm really leaning into understanding that. A lot of times we don't take the time to retrospect, you know, to to look back and ask. We're just really pushing into, I hate this job, I need a different one. And that, that, that kind of movement doesn't help us. So we need to slow it down and be a little bit more deliberate about the whys. Sometimes, you know, I I feel like there's always three things in your career. It's, it's who you report to. So a lot of times your boss can make or break how you feel about your job. It's the culture of the organization and it's the work you do. So if you look at those three things and say, which one of those three is it? And then once you can articulate that, you have to ask yourself, well, if it's my boss, that's making me miserable. What's the type of boss I'd like to work for? Um, And so you, you have to start bringing these things to the surface. Once you do that, 
and you make your plan, then this is something I wish I had learned a lot earlier. You have to network. So you have to, the best way to get in a door that you'd like to be in is to find someone who's already in the door to walk you in. And so it's so important that in our career, we don't just, you know, someone once told me the lie, you just put your head down and work as hard as you can and you'll go straight to the top. That's not true. You have to, you know, you have to network with people. You have to see people. You have to empathize. You have to create and build friendships with people. And then they will walk you through any door you want to go through. So if you're not happy in your career, ask yourself those questions and start building those bridges and those relationships now so that when you need them, they'll be there. But then also when they need you, you can be there for them as well. Yeah, I've done this in the past, just going to any door that seemed to be open without, you know, if a door closed on you, taking assessment, as you're saying, look at these aspects to realize what it is that is best suited to your needs. And not only that, making a good network connection to get through that door. Yeah. Very vital information. How can people reach you, Natalie? Yeah. So um, if you are on Instagram or Facebook or LinkedIn, you can find me at Innovation Meets Leadership. Um, that's how you can find me there. And then also uh, Twitter and LinkedIn, you can find me at Natalie Bourne. Natalie Bourne, one more question. Why do you work? Uh, well, I feel that work is personal. It is something that's just in our DNA and we're created to do. And um, I work to not only provide for my family, but also to provide uh, fulfillment and purpose for my days here on this earth. And then also to make an impact. So to leave people with um, a legacy of ideas and uh, frameworks that they can use to make their work and their life better. Natalie Bourne, I like create it and purpose and legacy. Yeah. Those are very good words. Thank you, Natalie Bourne. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Brian. It was great to be here. Thank you.